Welcome to the 3M, inaugural 3M National Industry Night live education event. We are so happy to have you here. It is our mission over the next 60 minutes to bring you insight, perspective, knowledge that helps bring more attention and awareness to maybe one of the most overlooked uh, procedures in the collision repair process, and that's corrosion protection. So I'm uh, super happy to be joined by uh, my colleagues, Sean Collins and Dennis Kiker, who together uh, have Boy, oh boy, over 50 years of industry experience and, 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 came, from, <laughs> and came from the shop world. So, uh, Dennis, why don't you go ahead and uh, give us a little bit about your industry experience, your background, and uh, what makes you so passionate about this topic? Okay, well, my background is actually coming out of the industry, and uh, like my colleague Sean here, we both worked in shops, myself for 21 years, and then went to work for 3M, and uh, got the privilege of working today in the laboratory there, and that's been a really good experience. And, and, and probably what made me most passionate about this is just understanding what goes on in the shop on a day-to-day -day basis. But then relating to that back to what the OEMs are talking about doing yep. to do the repair. And then some of the experience that we've had from 3M uh, in the field work and seeing some of the things that are probably the, the most overlooked are the most important pieces sure. and probably some of the simplest things to do in the repair and that's right. corrosion protection. Right. Sure. Yeah, Sean, how about yourself and, well, and, and your passion, right? Right, right. So my background is similar to Dennis, was a collision tech for many years, 25 plus years. Uh, during that time, I was also an ICAR instructor. So that's one of the first courses I started to teach for ICAR 24 years ago was corrosion protection. Right. And I noticed that really things have not changed as far as procedures. Products have gotten much better, but the procedures are pretty much the same as they were 20 years ago. And therefore, it's a little surprising that we're still talking about these things, but um, you know, the, the knowledge is out there and we're gonna try to uh, educate you up as good as we can here tonight on the corrosion protection. Fantastic, so as, as both of these guys mentioned, they'll bring a lot of insights and knowledge, um, but we are in a different era. And we wanted to, to start out by sharing just an example and, and no endorsement by 3M or recommendation as far as this video or company is concerned, but this is a video that came to Sean and, and exemplifies um, uh, where we are in collision repair today. In the evening, I was unfortunate enough to have someone turn in front of me. The impact it was immediate and full speed, uh, 45 miles per hour. I thought I did everything correctly. I called Land Rover of America to find out who they recommended to repair the vehicle. They sent me to a shop in Charlotte. His vehicle was repaired at another shop. Prior to him contacting us, one of the, the biggest concerns he had is that uh, if he held his steering wheel straight, the vehicle didn't go down the road straight. Each time I would go over a pothole, a bump in the road, obvious metal on metal, clanking sound noises. Once we looked at the vehicle, uh, it didn't take very long for us to notice that there were major issues. Michael invited me over to the shop at K&M and was able to show me uh, some of the issues that me not being a mechanic would have never known to even look for. What we noticed in our initial visual inspection of the vehicle was that the gap from the door to fender on the driver's side of the vehicle was wide, much wider than what the factory tolerances are. Also, the gap on the hood to fender on the left side were much wider than what factory tolerance allows for. Typically, when you do see gap or panel misalignment, it tells you that the structural parts are bent or outside of what the factory tolerances allow for. When I first talked to my insurance adjuster that I was dealing with and the body shop, I was concerned that there might be frame damage because I knew how hard I hit the other vehicle. I asked that question repeatedly and was assured, no, there's no frame damage. On the frame of the vehicle, there were actually places where there had been tears in the frame. There had been bends and buckles in that left front and lower area of the frame. There were hammer marks in the frame. There was even an area where they had attempted to uh, re-weld a section of the frame where the weld had broke loose during the accident. Those issues alone would have justified originally that the frame needed replacement. There's substantial rust. Over time, it's gonna wear down the strength of the frame and that's really the backbone of the vehicle. Winter driving, I go to the mountains a lot. Uh, those problems were only gonna get worse. And in the end, that was gonna be my responsibility. It's probably not gonna be the collision center's issue. At that point, it's gonna be more money out of my pocket and more money that they saved from the get-go. The front structure of the vehicle had shifted uh, 
pretty significantly affect to the right. When you've got a structure that is not aligned properly or bent, everything changes. The way it crushes in an accident changes, which sets off a chain reaction of events that ultimately affect how the airbags may or may not deploy. You could have a situation where the airbags deploy too soon. You have a situation where the airbags may deploy too late. The vehicle is no longer within the manufacturer's guidelines of what's acceptable, so no one knows how it's going to perform in an accident. Well, guys, key takeaways? Well, my key takeaway is that we live in a new era in collision repair now. I call it the post-repair inspection era. And uh, there's a, a much better chance nowadays of having your car looked at by somebody else, whether it's a day down the road, a week, a year, somebody else looking at that, actually trying to point out any incorrect or, uh, or unfinished repairs. So it's a completely new era. Dennis? Social media can be your best friend or your worst enemy. So this kind of information gets out. It can, uh, if it's bad news, you know what happens. Well, it hits the mainstream media. We all know we're in a digital environment and things go viral before we know it, yep. so any which way. Um, you know, Sean, moving forward, um, would, would this, would this be, you know, so you get, you, you, somebody posts about your shop, is, is that right. truly your worst nightmare? Right. Yeah, a lot of guys would say, oh man, if it hit the media and embarrass the shop or whatever, that'd be my worst nightmare. Actually, if somebody was injured or killed, that would be a much worse nightmare. So that's what we're here to talk about today is how to protect ourselves from, you know, bad situations. Yeah, absolutely. So um, over the course of, over the course of the next uh, 60 minutes. Uh, we're gonna bring you a lot of knowledge and insights both from these gentlemen as well as the OEMs and, and some of our industry uh, alliance providers. Um, you know, our goal and our mission here is, is to help you protect yourself, help you protect your shop, and help you protect your customer and, and by bringing attention to one of the most overlooked, as we mentioned, overlooked repair processes, which is typically around corrosion protection. So um, we'll go soup to nuts, so to speak, and uh, let's, get, let's get going. So. You know, we just saw the video. We saw the video. Obviously, that's that's a concern or a reason for heightened QC quality control. John, talk a little bit about you know why why heightened outside of just mainstream media. Sure. Well, the post repair inspection companies are springing up all over the country. I've heard from several of them. They have plans to expand to many more markets. So this is not going away. This right. is going to be more and more prevalent. People have seen there's a way to make money. So uh, we're going to continue to see more of this. Um, now we also see where some collision shops are also inspecting their competitors' work, where they're advertising, posting signs, if you've had your vehicle repaired, um, bring it here, we'll take another look at it, and that's when they dig in and look for things like the red flags of corrosion protection. Which we're going to talk about. Exactly. Of, uh, a variety exactly. of different red flags. So we live in a litigious society and people see there's money to be made there. Absolutely. So, you know, one of the bigger areas, uh, of course, that we want to emphasize and focus around is safety is a priority. Dennis, yeah, yep. I mean, you know a lot yeah, about so, this. So I'll take a, up a couple of these slides and we'll talk a little bit about what the OEMs do uh, and their efforts to prevent anything from going wrong with the car to crash. So obviously they design it in right at the, right at the design table and then also they're going to uh, facilitate that by incorporating the right materials like high strength steels and things that are, are in the build of the car and then test it and prove it out. And at the end of the day, I think you're gonna find that when we look at the next couple of slides, we're gonna be looking at what do they do to prevent corrosion from forming after the car is assembled. Absolutely. So let's take a look at this next slide because Oftentimes, you know, we know that there's e-coat that goes on at the, at the factory. Now, I've had the pleasure when I worked with 3M to go to many of these factory uh, sealer decks and coating decks, yep. and yep. I can see this happen. And we're going we're gonna to be seeing some videos here, too. But this process here starts before, actually, the, what you see on the, on the slide now is before the car even gets to the paint portion of the. So right. this is kind of the prep step. So we've got this bare steel body that's all welded together. Well, it has to be clean because it has a lot of mill oil and, and, and stuff that just contaminates from, yep. fr from the welding deck. Okay, so you got all, this, all these cleaning and degreasing steps here. And by the way, we don't see any copper used in any of this process. It's zinc. They're using a zinc or a phosphate to prep this all out. But we're going through hot water pre degreasers, pre-degreaser, conditioning sprays. So there's a lot of steps that are done. If the factory could do it shorter and faster, they would do it. Absolutely. So let's take a look at another slide because now you're going to see the actual video. video. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at this one. <clears throat> 
So, so what is this the this would be the kind of the first step as you highlighted or you you outlined uh, on the previous slide? This is one of the steps so you can see that this is more of a clear material so this could be uh, a, a degreasing step or a washing step so you can see the whole body goes through this and then it's going to be rinsed and sprayed afterwards and then the next portion of this video you're going to see the car actually the car body going into the paint. So this is going into the E-coat, the primer that we all see yep. on the parts when you buy them from a dealer. You get a part that has E-coat on it. This is the E-coat bath with the whole car body. Doors, all the closure panels are attached on this body. So you're going to see this whole body that's electrically charged and then with a positive charge and the paint is actually charged with a negative charge so that it attracts, that E-coat is attracted to the material or to the body of the car. Now when they raise the car out, you'll see it all draining off. Oftentimes guys, you know, you look at uh, the body of a car when we're doing a repair and say, well, why do they have all these holes punched in there? Well, you can see that they have to drain all that paint out of there. That's one reason why. So, right. so the big advantage I see there, and I picture this in my head as it goes through that process, is that that primer is being drawn into all those flanges yep. where it's been welded together. That's submerged. Sucked and, into yep, those flanges and, yep. and covering those areas where we cannot. Goes around that. all the welds, it surrounds everything completely coats everything. Right. You can't do these processes in your shop. Right, right. So speaking of which, obviously we've, we've got another short video that you, you mentioned being on the seam sealer deck. You know, this, this video is really intended to be able, again, to that point where a robot, right, is, is applying the material, but there's also some other steps involved. Let's give, let's start the other video and walk us through it, Dennis. <clears throat> yeah, so this is kind of cool because now the, the car comes out of the, of the e-coat bath it gets baked at about 350 degrees okay. another thing you can't do in your shop right then it goes to the the sealer deck so now everything has primer on it everywhere the whole body is covered with a primer that's resistant to corrosion and now they're going to put the seam sealer on so there's no bare metal that's getting any seam sealer on it here now we know that in shops guys would like to take a you know take the step of putting uh sealer on bare metal and it's possible to do that but there are some cautions around that as well so here you see the robots apply the material and uh, you'll see it a, oftentimes they'll have a, a human operator will go around and, and do some skiving off of some of the areas where the robot can't get complete coverage like the corner of that deck lid or things yep. that we saw in there. This is pretty interesting because you can actually see that they're, they're going to seal the door with the door in a closed position. So totally impossible for, for us to do that but this is just an example of how the factory does this application. So Dennis, this is also a reason why when we get replacement parts, like a door or a hood, oftentimes they're not seam sealed because they never got to the seam sealer deck. Yeah, so the, even though the vehicle may have had sealer on it, yep. um, you'll get a replacement part that doesn't have sealer. Interestingly enough, we're gonna see that sometimes the factory is going to want you to seal the panel even if it didn't have sealer on it originally. The factory is going to want us to seal the panel even if it didn't have it originally. On the original build. Right on. So they want you to take an extra step, and we're going to talk about that when we get a little deeper into this presentation. We'll show you some information from the OEMs. And the, the biggest reason for that is now that we've welded on that area in most cases, so we have to protect those welded areas. Right on. That's different. You know, one of the things as we move forward, one of the things that um, I think was most striking to me in that first video is, is literally millimeters matter. Right. And, and this is something that, through my experience in working with you, and you shared a short story I'm sure you'll share about uh, Verifax conference this year, but how important it is to make sure that the car is getting repaired and getting that cavity wax and corrosion protection because it compromises the structural, and can compromise the structural integrity and compromise how the vehicle collapses in an right. accident. Right, well, we oftentimes think of corrosion protection or corrosion as a cosmetic thing, not really structural. But as Dennis mentioned, you know, they're using more high strength steels, they're getting thinner, they're compromised much quicker by corrosion. So this is just showing you how the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, the chart on the left, yep. identifies intrusion in a crash test, intrusion into the passenger cabin, okay. that safety cage we're sitting in. So they measure various areas. You look at the blue line down on the bottom of the chart, and, it, and it's how many millimeters of intrusion into the cabin, and areas like the A-pillar, the tow pan, the, the floor pan, the brake pedal, the steering column, the emergency brake pedal, the cowl. So all those areas, they measure how much intrusion. And you can imagine if you've got an improperly repaired area in the front or lack of corrosion protection and it's very rusty, it's not gonna collapse in the same way right. and it's gonna affect things like even airbag timing. 
So, you know, it's very critical we protect those areas because millimeters count. And a quick story, a guy I worked with, his wife was in a really bad collision. He went to collect her belongings at the salvage yard from the vehicle, opened the door, and there were her shoes wedged into the crumpled up floor pan, wow. okay? So he realized, wow, just think of how millimeters are important. It could have even been worse, yep. or maybe it could have been better if it was repaired correctly. So it could be the difference between somebody, you know, walking away unscathed yep. or walking away crippled or even, you know, a severe injury or death. Right. Right. So the millimeters are very, very important. We Absolutely. have to remember that. Absolutely. You know, sometimes, uh, Dennis, I, I know that this is something that, you know, you, you believe. Sometimes, it, it, although it seems impossible, we, we can and, and we need to do more than, than the OEMs when it comes to aftermarket and, and repairing the vehicle. Yeah, and that has to do, Andy, with a lot with the fact that we can't do things the same way right. that the factory did. So um, when we do all this re restoration of the vehicle after a crash, of course we want to restore the structure, the integrity, and the safety right. of the vehicle. But even more importantly, think about those proper welding techniques. You might be a great welder and you have the OEM procedures and knowledge, but if you lack taking that last step of corrosion protection, it's all for naught. doesn't really matter because then the millimeters will matter at the end of the day, yeah. right? Yeah. So protect, protect the work that you do. Uh, do that last little simple step and make sure you, you do the corrosion protection step uh, because that's a, that's super important. Right, right, right. I mean, it actually dovetails nicely into something that, that you wrote uh, just last year, I believe, specific to corrosion protection. Right, right. Wrote an article called Your Repairs Are Under Attack, and I specifically used the word attack because that's what's happening. The second we stop welding on that vehicle, the corrosion process starts. Even the welding process, especially MIG welding, by the way, which, which creates hot spots, yep. um, the second we're done, it can actually start the condensation problem from process from the cooling metal and immediately begins to attack those welds. And again, if we've got weak welds, we've got a, you know, a, a dangerous structural repair. So that's what this is all about. It's inexpensive insurance, right? So just applying that cavity wax to protect all our welded areas is, is doesn't take a long time, and again, is very inexpensive insurance from the inevitable from, or the, from the alternative which we see here. So, if you're not doing those those steps and practicing that good corrosion protection, somebody may look at that vehicle, and of course, these are the big red flags, right? These inspectors, you know, some of them aren't even really collision repair people. They know what to look for, but they're not going to be able to look at a vehicle and tell whether the frame is swayed five millimeters sure. to one side. Right, right. But they can certainly open a panel or a deck lid open and see corrosion inside or get in with a boroscope and see the corrosion. So it's, it's low-hanging fruit for anyone looking for some flaws in that vehicle repair. Right on. So you can see, you know, I'm not going to go through the dollar figures, but you can see it could get very expensive for a shop to have somebody look at that vehicle and be compensated for right. the improper repairs. Right. right, so I mean, one of the things that we wanted to be able to do is be able to call out some of the red flags that we typically see. And, and these, are, these are images that you found or, or have been sent into right. you and, and right. some of the most common uh, overlooked right. uh, areas or red flags. Yep, so people send me these all the time, the previous pictures of those vehicles and pictures like this, they, they send them to me all the time. I have pages of these from when I did vehicle inspections. It's, it's not uncommon, that's the big point. It's very, very common for guys to miss these areas. So you see untreated welds, and the one on the right is a structural part. Um, those welds there are holding on that bumper reinforcement. So you can imagine in a harsh climate like we're from Minnesota, yeah, yeah. where they use the chemicals and, the, and the, the snow and ice and slush and everything, it would not take long to compromise those welds and affect how that vehicle reacts um, as far as absorbing energy or airbag timing. So, so Sean, Sean, I got a question. If, if I'm going to be doing this welding and I want to avoid that burn charred e-coat that's on the back side of these parts, is there a simple process a guy could do when... Yeah, that, that's a great question and actually a lot of the manufacturers are now starting to recommend even on the back side of a part that you're welding, clean the paint coatings off ahead of time so you don't end up with that burnt charred paint. Okay. And it's most important inside of a cavity like a frame rail. Yeah. So if you're gonna section a frame rail and, and weld around the perimeter, you know, first clean off the coatings inside for like that first inch so that you don't have those burnt flaking coatings right. that nothing is gonna stick to them, right. whether it's a cavity wax primer or whatever. So right. clean the coatings off. Interesting that you mentioned, you know, on the inside and the outside, and we've got a couple of more examples here, but you one I want to call attention to is, is the Boris, the tool, the boroscope. Yeah, you see the soot inside that quarter panel, right. for one thing, 
Dennis, what are your comments here? Yeah, so I mean, it's a, a simple operation to go ahead and clean, the, clean that off before you put the seam sealer on and make sure you dress all the welds. And, and I really love the idea of going on the inside of these areas because on the right lower portion of this slide, it looks like the boroscope exposed the fact that uh, there's, some, there's some burned charred e-coat. So before those panels were joined together, it would have been a really easy step to take a file belt and just uh, use a, a, a or some sort of a non-woven type of disc or whatever you want to use to clean the e-coat off so that when you did the weld, you had a clean finished area that the, the, and then put cavity waxed in there. Right, right, for sure. So we have a question actually that's come in from the live feed. Uh, the live feed, we, you can text, uh, we've had it up on the screen there, a phone number, and we've got the hashtag 3M Collision, and I just want to pose it uh, to you, Dennis. Isn't it better to use epoxy primer inside of a closed cavity and sectioning location before cavity wax? Yeah, well, that, and that kind of gets at what we were just talking about. So if, if there was burn charred paint in there and I sprayed it with epoxy primer, and that kind of was the school of thought a few years back, but since then, it's kind of changed because if I sprayed it with, with epoxy primer, epoxy primer would dry to a dry film. Right. And if it was on burned, charred paint and soot, it would just flake off. Okay. So if I put cavity wax over it, it would just flake off. Okay. So the best thing you do is, is to prep the back side of the part and use just cavity wax on that area. Very not to mention that epoxy primer is very slow, slow drying curing, and if yep. it pools in the bottom of a rail, yep. it might be days before it's actually and it, and it's worse to cover epoxy primer before it completely cures because it, then it, it actually makes the whole the whole repair start right. the coating system start to fail right. right okay so you know one of the things and, and Sean you talk a lot about this and you've taught me a lot about this is uh, if the inspectors are going to have the tool in other words having the right tool for the job but if the inspectors going to have the tool we should have the tool as well this is an example of a tool a boroscope uh, provided by snap-on additionally uh, a nice mobile option, a very inexpensive mobile option you can find online that literally turns your phone into a boroscope. So, you know, it's, it's a good tool for you to be able to have as a technician in your back pocket, literally with the cable that hooks into your phone and something that can help you avoid situations, unfortunately, like this one. It's a multi-million dollar lawsuit. Sean. Right. Well, the interesting thing here, if you look at the photo on the right, you can see that somebody sectioned a quarter panel at the sail panel, which is common practice and you know recommended by many OEMs. So they didn't do anything wrong there. They made the weld, and the weld looks okay, but now you see the weld is badly corroded. Okay, So the one thing to notice here is in, circled in red, you can see where there was factory cavity wax on the original panel, but you can see there's none there. Um, where I scraped it off with my fingernail, you could see where it was, but there's none over the welded area or over the new replacement panel. Right. So they didn't get cavity wax in there. And again, you know, that's an area that could be critical in how that vehicle collapses in the accident. Not to mention that there's probably an airbag inflator bolted right to the inside of that sail panel as well that would be changed how that operates if the, the metal is weakened in that area. So again, just, you know, very, inexpensive insurance having that cavity wax in there. And it could mean, mean the difference in millimeters between whether, again, somebody is completely unscathed or has some type of injury. So, Sean, we're talking about outer panels here, and, and obviously a quarter panel, but a quarter panel, a rocker panel, um, a pillar, all these outer panels that, you know, they're not necessarily, in fact, this one you would consider probably not a structural panel. Yeah. However, Anytime you're, you're saying, anytime you're replacing those outer panels, you should be putting cavity wax in them because it could in, indeed af affect the the collision worthiness of sure. that of that. Sure, I mean car. they are outer panels, but they are part of that overall um, system that how that vehicle collapses. transfers the energy. So, so yeah. sure, so it's not a structural part, but it still could have some effect on how that vehicle absorbs energy, especially okay. if it's really badly corroded and it's really doing no good at all. Right. I, yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, one of the things that, that we definitely want to point out, obviously we've talked about, um, you know, kind of the dangers around and not using corrosion protection products. We've talked, to, talked about, uh, you know, the OEMs as far as how they do it at the, uh, at, at, in their facilities. We have loads of training and information available to you that, that can help you kind of understand uh, how to use the products, why to use the products, where to use the products. Of course, 3mcollision.com is a great, great resource. We've continued to try to make improvements to that, specifically a new part number tool. So when you, we reach you on 3mcollision.com, we understand you're looking for things. 
We have a, a part number tool that we've updated. Uh, additionally, we now have a collision repair solutions app. So that really is intended to house those SOPs and a lot of those videos, again, to make it quick and easy for you to find real world technician content. Specific to that is, is YouTube. You know, so we have 3M Collision Repair Solutions YouTube channel, 372 videos we keep adding to that. And I think one of my favorite things not coming from the industry is being able to learn real world types of practices with tech tip vi tips videos. And that's something that both Sean and Dennis have been avid in doing and continue to do is taking real world applications and helping you with those such as trying to match OEM seam sealers. Um, you have uh, uh, ICAR, of course. ICAR is uh, partnering with us uh, to bring you this content. Um, and of course, they have a, a whole host of information um, that, again, both uh, 3M as well as OEM, and we're going to talk a little bit about that using ICAR, the ICAR portal, the RTS portal, to get into some of those guidelines. But we do have, and I have another question that's pop, popped up on the screen, uh, a very good question, actually, relevant to what we just covered. Uh, I want to ask each of you guys, what's the single best video that you think a technician, Dennis, what is the single best video a technician could watch? So there's a lot of them around seam sealer because seam sealer obviously matching the OEM's appearance is really important. And I think the one that, uh, that I like the best is gonna be the roof ditch seam sealer. So, okay. so the area on the top of the roof of the vehicle uh, where the roof skin and the unicide join together, uh, they're, they're becoming a pretty tricky kind of seam, seams to match. And there's a great video that we have on our SOPs for that. Great, Sean, how about you? Well, I've gone back and forth on this. I think the foams video, we have several on foams of how to apply foams and choosing the correct foam. And I mention that now because since we've been here in Arkansas, we've had three inquiries on how do I know which foam to use and how do I apply foam. So the foam videos are, are really good videos. Okay. And all of them available on 3mcollision.com as well as the... Uh, as well as the YouTube channel that we have. So moving forward, knowledge is power. We, of course, mentioned ICAR. And Sean, you being an ICAR instructor and being with ICAR uh, as, a, as a partner for decades, um, walk us through what you love so much about their accessibility of information. Right, right. Well, the new thing is the RTS. And as long as you have an ICAR number, you can access the RTS. So if you've had any training at all. So you can go to their site. And what I did is I just simply typed in corrosion protection into the search box. And that brought me to all their corrosion protection information. Now, they also have a hotline. If you run into, hey, can I section this frame rail, you can call them. Usually within 30 minutes, they get back to you with an answer. They're very good about it. But the corrosion protection brought us to these documents here. So these documents are general information. And we're going to show you some more specific information as well. But the, the documents appear here. And they will give you a link, as you see in the bottom left corner, a link directly to the OEM website. And, you know, I think one of the things that we want to point out here is, is that, you know, we're looking at Ford Lincoln, and of course it can direct you there. Now, some of these you do have to pay for, but there right. are a lot of free resources. But again, they, that's exactly what they're intended to do, is be resources for you. But it's not just Ford and Lincoln suggesting that you need to be applying corrosion protection to all of your repairs, as well as many new panels or replacement panels. Right. VW, Mazda, um, FCA, right, they're all calling out and we're going to review these things in detail, but ultimately when you see these things, use this as documentation, right? So we want to be recording these things and we want to make a note because the OEMs are suggesting that yes, corrosion protection and cavity wax is a required item to protect, of course, all of the repairs. So let's get a little bit deeper in here and we'll start with FCA and Dennis, if you would, just, just take us through what FCA uses as guidelines around corrosion protection. Yeah, so this is interesting because oftentimes people just overlook this or maybe they, they never even went out there and, and sourced this information. But this is just their, this is their high level corrosion protection guideline. They're saying when working around pinch weld flanges, seam sealers should be installed to duplicate the original appearance and function. Okay, let's see what the next document says. All hem flanges on closure panels should be sealed whether sealer is apparent or not. And so now we're talking about deck lids, hoods, doors, lift gates, hem flanges. All of them should be sealed whether sealer is apparent or not, okay? So doing more than the OEM actually did. So don't worry about that. Don't stress and say, I can't do more than the OEM and, did. And here's, a, and here's a document that right. supports it. 
So right. when you have to make that decision to do it, you can you can you can be assured that there's a documentation that'll support that that you can that you can give to your insurance uh, provider. Sure. Okay. So then uh, lap joints, such as floor pan joints, should be sealed to duplicate the original sealer, but also addressed on any exterior surface by sealing the lap, whether visible or not. So now we've got a, a video we're going to show you that kind of addresses that. And it's, it specifically deals with a frame rail and a McPherson strut tower. So we're gonna see where these, these two joints join together. Sealer is not apparent there, but we're going to, we're gonna show you how we would do that. Good, let's do it. So Dennis, I see you've started off with some seam sealer in here. First of all, why don't you tell me what kind of seam sealer is that? Yeah, so Sean, I, I chose a, a one part sealer for this. And I thought this was my best option because for one thing, I'm not really that concerned with, with a, a cycle time with this particular job because this job's gonna be in the shop for a while. It's a, it's a rail apron job. It's probably gonna be here for a couple more days at least. So um, I know this product has really good uh, adhesion to bare metal, to e-coat, anything. The surface has to be prepped out properly, but it has a really good corrosion resistant properties. And it's easy to tool. It gives me lots of open time. And it's probably the most economical option to be ob uh, obvious about. You know, it's, it's a great product for this type of application. Any kind of inside applications where cycle time isn't a big consideration. So as far as cycle time, if I was doing a door skin, for example, that's maybe when I would go to a two-part like this where I can handle the door right away very quickly. Yeah, exactly. That's going to cut the time down significantly. I mean, this is a 30-minute paint time. So that, you know, 15 minutes I can be painting it. So. Um, I'm not so concerned about painting this quickly either way, so it really doesn't matter. Okay. So now, you've seam sealed here. What if there was no seam seal in here from the factory? Now, I see there's some MIG welds here. So does that have an effect on whether we're seam sealing or not? Um, you know, really, the best thing to do is follow what the OEM says. And we know that from looking at the OEM statements uh, that we're going to be talking about during this presentation, that it's important uh, to seal even when the factory didn't have sealer in these places. So in this case, factory may, may not have had sealer in here, but you remember the factory can also put the car through a, through a tank in the e-coat process. So they're really getting uh, paint everywhere around all the welds, everything continuous. Whereas here, once I plug weld with this, these areas with the MIG, I'm gonna have some hot spots that are gonna cause corrosion. So I have to go ahead and seal this off, keep any kind of moisture from getting in between there. Okay, so in other words, once we've welded on a replacement panel, things get different than what they had at the factory, where we may need to seam seal regardless. We're yeah. taking extra precaution uh, and doing a little more than maybe what the factory yeah, had. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Okay, all right. So what would we do on the inside of this panel? You know, that's a great question. So generally speaking, the rule of thumb is gonna be to seal on the inside and on the outside of any of these joints that you form together. So in this case, we you know, have basically an overlap seam on the opposite side of this where this apron joins the other side of this rail. Uh, it's gonna be important to seal that seam as well. We wanna keep water from getting between those two panels. Okay, well I see there's also some MIG welds right here. Why don't you finish up doing your seam sealing here and then we'll take a look at the inside. Great, great idea. Okay, Dennis, now I see you've sealed the inside of that rail. Yep. There's two things I noticed. Number one, there's no seam sealer on the opposite frame right. rail. Yeah. And I noticed you put a very thin application or a very small bead on there. What was the purpose of that? So, um, again, I'm gonna follow the OEM's recommendations. They're saying seal the seam, seal it inside, seal it outside, keep the water out of that joint. But I know I wanna make this look nice and clean here. Um, as you said, the other side, I, I can't see the seam sealer on this. Right. But again, this car, when it was built, went through an e-coat bath, so we can't do that here. So the idea is that when I seal the seam, I tool it off to a nice, clean, as, as kind of radiused in and finished look as I can possibly get. Then it's a nice, clean application. When, when my painter comes back in here and does his color coat application, basically this is gonna be an almost invisible. Right, so you got the function where you've got it all sealed off, but it still looks very similar, especially after it's painted, it's gonna look very similar to the other side where you really can't tell it's been 
seam sealed. Yeah, exactly. As it the other side. Exactly. And that's the point of this. Yep. Seal it off, but make it look the same. Yeah, it's kind of a neat, clean application. Same thing up here, Sean. If we were doing, let's say, a tie bar or something like that, and I wanted a nice, clean application, if I take this urethane seam sealer or even a two part and I just radius it in really nice and clean around the edge, I know that I've sealed that joint up nice and tight. There's no water that's going to get in there and start corrosion between sure. those two pieces of metal. Now, if it had a giant, you know, caterpillar looking bead or yeah. a brush bead, you'd want to duplicate that. Exactly. So but then. In this case, yeah, in this case there was there was no seam sealer. So I want to radius it in there nice and clean and make it look nice. Looks good. Thanks. So we'll take a look at uh, keep moving along here and take a look at, at the at the next uh, next bullet. Yeah, so some uh, more interesting stuff that comes out of the OEM's guidelines. But uh, if you if you haven't looked, you wouldn't know. Right. So you don't know what you don't know. Sure. So in this case they're saying all new panels and repair areas must have inner panel corrosion protection, cavity wax applied after the painting operation is complete but before a trim is installed. Okay, one more. So I'll take this one. So this is kind of uh, uh, something I see all the time. Um, this goes way back to many years ago when, uh, I think it was 08, about 10 years ago, when Chrysler came out and said, we no longer recommend the use of any weld through primer during repairs. Okay, doesn't matter if we're MIG welding or if we're squeeze type welding with Chrysler, no weld through primer. So a lot of guys got confused by that and thought, well, what do we just leave bare metal in there or what do we do? Well, they didn't remember the second part of the statement that says weld bonding, in other words, squeeze type welding through an adhesive with corrosion protecting adhesives or sealers. So they're talking about a seam sealer now like this. Um, you, have, you can weld through either one of those along with final application of inner panel corrosion protection is the proper method. So they're saying have something in that joint, um, but now if we're MIG welding, they, you can't obviously MIG weld through an adhesive or right. a sealer, so now you are leaving that joint blank, you know, with no coatings on it. However, we're going to show you the cavity wax testing results and show why that should not make you nervous yep. and you should be comfortable with that because we're going to get the protection there. From so the cavity wax. From the cavity wax. Okay. If we leave that open in there with, with no coatings, the cavity wax will take care of it. So remember the second half of that statement. Don't use a weld through primer, but use something in that joint. So moving forward, of course, that's what FCA says. And Dennis, you know, here's, here's Honda. And of course, it, we highlight revised. Right, so this is a revision that came out last summer from Honda. And, and, and again, they're following some of the same discoveries that FCA had when they did their own testing. And they said, you know what? If you're doing MIG or MAG welding, so it could be butt welding, it could be plug welding with a MIG. If you're doing that type of welding, you should not be using any kind of weld through primer. And they specifically use a zinc rich weld through primer. They call that out on the slide you see, okay? But if you're going to go ahead and use a spot welder, a squeeze type resistant spot welder, not a problem. So, you know, a lot, now we're starting to see a lot of MIG brazing coming out too. So that, again, they're saying do not use any kind of weld through zinc rich primer when you're doing uh, MIG brazing or MIG or MAG welding, no. And by the way, that's really important because if you take and you do weld over the top of weld through primer, right through it. Um, if you take that weld and shear it in half and look at it under a microscope, yeah. it looks like a sponge. Very porous, not nearly the strength that right. is required. So it's very dangerous to do something like that. So they want you to be MIG welding on nothing but clean bare metal. Okay, okay, so that's Honda. How about GM, Dennis? I know you, you were gonna take us through GM and specific to cavity wax and corrosion protection. Yeah, so this is kind of high level guidelines again, but we're, you know, these are just descriptions that General Motors starts with and they're saying the closed cavity coatings remain sticky to the touch. So just kind of giving you a definition of what a closed cavity coating or a cavity wax type of coating would be. And uh, we've got, um, We've got a short video here we're going to show, and it's going to show the application of uh, cavity wax. Sure, and getting into tough spaces. Let's roll it. So Dennis, looking at this part of the vehicle here, this is a really common operation, right? It's a technician sections in this area. You see there's a sleeve, there's been some plug welds, there's going to be a continuous weld here. Major corrosion hotspot, right? It's also a safety issue in this area. If this car was rear-ended, this could affect the way the car absorbs energy, collapses, so we really have to get that protected. So uh, tell me about what you're going to do here. So Sean, what I'm, what I'm really looking at doing is I want to make sure that we, we take a look at, and we put this clear plastic on here so we can look at coverage. Because you know guys will, will think that they have enough material in there, 
but it doesn't mean that they actually do. Right, and it's a blind cavity. It's a blind you cavity. You can't see what you're doing. Exactly. So we're gonna we're gonna do an application here, and I'm gonna look at getting in from a bunch of different access points as much as I possibly can. That's probably the most important aspect of this is adequate coverage is really what we're looking at here, right. and how to get ad adequate coverage, and how much should I really be using with this. That's probably the most important part. Sure, sure. So why don't you get your safety gear on, and we'll go ahead and spray some material in here. Sounds great. So Dennis, I see this has got nice coverage here, um, concentrated on that joint. Um, I, I see you got some down here as well. Yeah, I mean it's not going to hurt to get you know extra material down here, but primarily we want to be obviously most concerned with the uh, with the weld area where we've burned away the e coat on the inside of this. Right. I mean it's close right. close cavity, so I can't get in there and and sand. So you know the beauty of this type of material is that it stays soft. It never really hardens. It's not going to peel off. It's going to stick to that right. that metal, and it's it's going to protect that steel from oxygen, from water, from any kind of uh, any kind of material. It's going to start that corrosion process from happening. Sure. There. One thing we would recommend is is uh, spraying it over the weld area, but possibly cleaning this uh, the paint surfaces before we weld these together so you don't have charred paint on the back yeah, here, right? It's, it won't hurt to have very It's a great practice, it really is. So if, you're, if, you're gonna, if you know you're gonna be doing the welding here, it's a good idea to clean away the eco, clean it back far enough away from the weld zone so that you're not gonna have burned eco to right. deal with. Because right. that, again, is a contaminant. It's a loose material that is gonna prevent uh, the actual cavity wax from attaching itself to the steel. Right. So yeah, that's a really good point. Sure. Right, and and a lot of the manufacturers are getting away from spraying a primer in here first for that reason because if there is any loose paint, right. the primer falls off. Yeah. This isn't going to happen with this product, right? No, it'll it'll stay on the actual um, surface. Obviously, it's not going to fall off. It, it's not, never going to dry to a dry film where it could potentially peel off. Right. Okay, looks good. Awesome. Let's. Uh, we're going to move to doing a rail. So let's take a look at a rail section next, and then uh, we'll move on from there. Yes, and another aspect of corrosion protection, undercoating. Yeah, so this is back to the GM uh, corrosion treatment recommendation. We've got another description of a, of a type of material that's used, and they're describing undercoating, and it's dry to the touch, and it's used in wheelhouses and floor pans and inside rear compartments and underhood areas. But I've been kind of surprised by some of the statements that I see from OEMs oftentimes where I wouldn't expect them to say use an undercoating. Right. They want you to use an undercoating. As a protectant because they know that the part that you're buying didn't go through the same exact process that the car did when it went through those tanks. So it's a different, it's a different type of application that you have versus what they had when they built that car. Right. So let's take a look at what we have here for undercoating. It's another short video. Awesome, let's do it. So I see you went ahead and undercoated in this area here. Now, what, what do we need to consider about a, an, an area in this particular application? So one of the things, Sean, I, I obviously we want to look at first of all is going to be what does the OEM say? So I mean undercoating is always a good practice. Now there may or may not have been undercoating on this in the factory. In fact in this case there wasn't. But I know that GM is going to tell me that I need to put an undercoating on these outer panels. Now this is a material that dries through a dry film. Right? It's a rubberized material that dries dry. Uh, it's going to resist corrosion. It has a corrosion inhibitor in it as well as it's going to stop stones from chipping through it as long as I put enough of this material on. So I like to use about two to four coats 
In this case, we put about three coats on here. And if I was to go four, I, I wouldn't feel bad about that because I know that more is better. It's going to resist what are the, additional, the stone chips. What do the additional coats do for you? Why so many coats? You know, that's a great question. And, and you know, I've seen lots and lots of salt spray tests where we looked at kind of a, a breaking point for where things were going to be able to prevent corrosion after 1,500 hours. And it always seemed like a dry mill thickness around 10, 10 or slightly above 10 mils was going to give you the protection you really needed. Uh, under really harsh conditions. And so uh, this type of material, believe it or not, has about a 50% shrink rate from a wet mill thickness to a dry mill thickness. And I've seen that across many different products uh, related to undercoating. So it's not just this particular one, but in general, that's a rule of thumb. And, and so we found if you, put, if you put four coats on, it's gonna give you 20 plus mils. Now it depends on, on the settings on the gun, sure, sure. right? So. Um, you know, I had some pretty some pretty heavy coats I applied on here, but it's nice. This gun I can use low pressure. I don't have to overspray a lot. It's more convenient than an aerosol because I can paint any angle with it. So it's really kind of a handy piece to use. And you know, it, it may, it's it's nice clean application without a whole lot of overspray and easy to use. And thickness, are we worried about what stones will do to this area as well? Yeah, for sure. So there's going to be a, a shield in here, a fender liner, but of, of course that doesn't cover every square inch of this. So you, you're probably going to get some some stone chipping that's going to go on and some rubbing and chafing from the fender liner and whatnot. So yeah, it, it has a purpose to resist uh, stone chips and any kind of chafing or anything from any any fender liner or whatever that was going to go in this in this okay. application. So thorough coverage and enough coats to build up that mill thickness are the keys to this application. Yeah, yeah. Another great spot for this, Sean, that you, if you want to think about it, is of course this this car was on a on a repair bench, right? So it was on a it was clamped in quad clamps underneath here, so there's four clamps that were holding us up on the pinch welds, and we know that that area had to be cleaned off. So, um, again, that's important that you go ahead and use some undercoating. This is a paintable material, so I can go ahead and, and clean that up, dress it, scuff it, and I can put the undercoating on those areas, and when it dries, the painter can go ahead and paint uh, the color back on top of this with no problem. So, uh, another great application that guys oftentimes may forget about or or just may not get time to do, or again, it's, you know, I can turn this gun sideways or upside down and spray sure. with it, so that, that pinch weld area is a really important area to, to okay. coat back on there too. So the rule of thumb is on the outer exposed surfaces, you're gonna use something hard that dries a touch, inside you're gonna use the tacky. Yep, device. that's a great way to think about okay. it. All right, moving right along. Dennis, bullet three. Okay, yeah, so um, a couple other things that we have here, and, and Flange joints, overlap joints, and seams should be sealed with a quality seam sealer. So they're kind of just giving you a description of what the yep. seam sealer should be. They're saying it should maintain its flexibility after curing and be paintable, okay? So the last, the last one, and this is probably the one that I think is the most important, there's General Motors is saying replacement lids and doors will also require sealing in hem flange areas. Now you say it's most important, why? Because <laughs> I, I don't think that many people do this operation. Again, out of sight, out of mind, I just don't think well, about it? Well, no, and, here, and here's what happens. I, I believe that when, when folks are repairing a car, they're thinking that they want to make it look as original as possible, and, and that's fine. But you should also follow the OEM guidelines. So if the OEM is telling you that they want you to seal the hem flanges on those new parts, that kind of trumps the original or the original appearance kind of thing, okay? So because those parts are don't go through the same exact process as the part car body did when it was built, they're telling you to do this part. So documentation, again, if I'm going to ask for the insurance company to pay for this, I better be able to document why I'm doing this. Sure. We have to kind of recondition technicians sometimes that we've been preaching so long to do it exactly like the car was built. Sure. But that's all changed with a lot of different procedures yeah. now. We do a lot of things different than the OEM did originally. They're telling us to do differently. Telling us to do it differently because Correct. it's more, it's, a, it's better structurally, it's a bet, right? better chance of us not having issues down the road. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. So we got GM. This is Honda. I mean, this this cutaway is, this is an eye opener even for me. Again, not a whole lot of tech yep. uh, background experience, but somebody right. like you, how many technicians do you think know or are applying anti-rust or, or corrosion protection cavity yeah. wax to all of these different areas? I don't think many techs are going all the way around the perimeters of the hoods and the deck lids. Right. Okay, I think a lot of guys don't realize that's what what Honda wants here. And by the way, that's why we made the wands for our cavity wax extremely small so you can fit them in those little drain holes and tight little 
uh, drain areas on those hoods and deck lids. And it's and not then, just it's just not just Honda. You got Toyota too. Correct. Yeah, it's it's not just Honda. Toyota says basically the same thing all the way around those perimeters, bottoms of the doors, fender arch, and down at the bottom of the fender, all the typical locations. But yeah, this is pretty surprising. And if you look at that closely, they're in frame rails and all those other common areas as well. But uh, a lot of guys would be surprised by that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Toyota, moving along, moving forward with Toyota, this is very comprehensive. This is a, a crib note, I think you, is what you said, and, and okay. specifically we're calling out weld on components. Yes, yeah, so there's a ton of information here. They're gonna call out weld on components in the area that I have circled there. And this has to do with a zinc rich uh, weld through primer. Okay. So again, now we got Toyota saying use weld through primer, but this is documentation from the OEM. So not everyone has the same stance or position on it, but uh, they're telling you to use it there. And they're also saying use a cavity wax as well, along with several other pieces on there. So we're not going to read them all off today, right. but, but certainly this kind of information is all, all available yep. if you want to source it from the OEM or in some cases you can go uh, to free sites to get it as well. Dennis, I have a question for you. So they call out zinc rich weld through primer. Many OEMs call out specifically zinc rich weld through primer. Do any call out copper? None. No copper. Okay. So, you know, cavity wax this is one of the things, and Dennis, I know, you, you know, you've spent a lot of time with cavity wax and you've spent a lot of time in the shops. Of course, people think cavity wax, they think maybe quarter, they think door cavity. Right. What about all the other areas? Yeah, what, are, what are some of the common ones that get messed Exactly, and, and, and I think in the, middle, in the middle of this slide is probably one of the most important pieces, and that's the radiator support, or core support area. I mean, it's front and center in the vehicle. So it's the one that's gonna get subjected to crashes primarily, right? You're gonna, you know, it's either rear or front, but typically those are the most of the impacts are in the front. You're gonna be welding in a new radiator support. It's gonna get welded into the upper rails and the lower rails. Sure. And, and those are highly susceptible to corrosion once you, if you spot weld or in, in most cases, you're gonna have to plug weld this because you can't get your spot weld tool inside those lower frame rails to do it like the factory did, yep. okay? So to Sean's point, Big time hot spot from a plug weld, okay? So that's a really hot spot for corrosion that's gonna form in there. Make sure that you, that you seal that up and or use cavity wax between the lower radiator support and the frame rail. Okay. And then also on the inside of the frame rail. Okay. And then even on the upper tie bar area to, uh, to shoot some cavity wax in there with the straw that's in the accessory kit, nothing wrong with that, or seal it the way you saw us do in the, in the previous video, where we're sealing it up and cleaning it off that sealer to have a nice, clean, radius appearance. Yeah. When I was inspecting vehicles, this was the most commonly missed area for corrosion protection. On the undersides of the tie bar where you weld something on, there was commonly burned paint or very low on the lower tie bar. You'd see that all the time. So very, very common, commonly neglected. Really think about that. Um, not to mention the fact that a lot of times the airbag sensors may be mounted on that radiator support or in that oh, close vicinity. Right, right. So specific to, we've been talking a lot about cavity wax and corrosion protection, of course. We have Cavity Wax Plus that's intended to do this. We talked about the wand, so the idea is to give the technician something that's easy, versatile, allows you to get in, 360 degree function. Okay, that's functionality, but let's talk a little bit about the testing that's done with these products uh, before they, they actually get out to the technicians. Yeah, so kind of the science behind, behind the product. Um, obviously, we have to prove out that, that this material is gonna do what we say it's gonna do. And we set the bar at 1500 hours with an ASTM test, American Standard Test Method. So, um, so we did this test and we knew that it worked well under controlled conditions, but we wanted to see in a practical environment what would it look like. So in, in this ne next test, uh, we created some mini frame rails. So these would be like welding, welding two small channels together. Sure. Uh, we used a couple different welding methods, and then we used several different prep methods. So we used some combinations of welding. We used plug welding, and then we also used spot welding. And then we used, we used different ways to prevent corrosion from forming in these. So, so can I see the next slide, please? Sure. Okay, so in, in these slides, if you look, start on the left, it's got a comparison of the two uh, different rails. So these were seamed together with a, a MIG butt joint. And then if you look directly in the center there, those number one and two, the left and right in the center, uh, you can see where the, where the seam was welded with a MIG butt joint. Uh, and one rail was protected with cavity wax and we also used weld through primer on the flanges where we uh, spot welded. Uh, the other rail had no cavity wax in it and, and no weld through primer used on it. So uh, no protection basically on the one in that right center uh, slide, the right 
uh, right slide number two, yep. and you can see the distinct difference in the corrosion. I mean, that, that butt weld joint is really going to be in trouble if we start to leave it in there any longer than 500. And this is 500 hours. Not 1,500. Not 1,500 hours. So, uh, you can see how big of a difference. I mean, how much that Mother Nature takes after the part when it's not protected. That's right. And if that was a structural frame rail that's relying on you, the vehicle's relying on that to collapse and absorb energy. If it's badly corroded, it's not going to do the same thing. Right, right. Yeah. So let's talk about some best practices. So, so this kind of goes back to what we saw from Chrysler, where they're saying don't use anything in those in those flanges when you're welding things together, but use cavity wax. Now, if you look on the left hand side, this was uh, a combination of of MIG plug welding and and spot welding, and that left hand uh, image, uh, the number three rail there. Uh, it has a n nothing, no weld through coating, no seam sealer, and no cavity wax. And on the right hand side, that image has uh, no weld through coating, but cavity wax, and then seam sealer around the outer perimeter of, of the joint. So we sealed that joint together from the outside. We yep. didn't weld through the sealer. And then we use cavity wax on the inside. And you can see that that weld flange is just pristine. And this is after 500 hours That's in the same environment that the rail on the left was in, exposed to. So uh, going back to what Chrysler and Honda were saying about uh, no, no weld through, well, you can see that as long as you seal that seam and you use cavity wax, you don't need weld You're through. You're good coating. to go. You know, it, go ahead. Well, so think about it. If you are not using weld through coating, and you're not using cavity wax, it's going to look like the one on the left. Exactly. Right? right. Yep. So that's why Chrysler says, hey, you have to have some kind of coating in there. And Dennis, I just wanted to ask you, so on these welded on panels, you should either be seam sealing both the front and the back, or if you don't have access to the back, like an enclosed cavity, you should be seam sealing the outside, cavity wax on the inside. Yes, exactly. That's pretty much it, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think the seam sealer, to me, uh, for my purposes, when I, when I saw the difference when we did multiple tests. Yep. I started to see the addition of that seam sealer on that flange really made a big difference. Yeah, yeah. And so we just yeah. used a simple single component urethane seam sealer and sealed that flange up and that made a huge difference. Right, right. And so, you know, going back to one of the things I love about these too is that they bring real world they bring real world test methods in. So they're trying to they're trying to mimic what would go on in a shop and they're trying to mimic the yeah. different processes as outlined by the OEMs. This I think is is another great example of 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 a unique test and Sean you know, you did this, I know, on a three-day weekend where it's yep. like, you know, okay, so I'm not on a horizontal surface. Gravity's working against me. How do I get cavity wax to, to A? Uh, flow uphill. Flow uphill yeah. and, and B, stay there. Right. That was a great segue, by the way. So here we see what I did is just a quick down and dirty test, not super scientific, but real world. So I took a couple plates. These are ICAR plates. And I just clamped them together yep. with some, some paper clamps. So you're in the top left. Yep. Right. Dipped them in just a little bit of a, 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 in the bottom of a pan of cavity wax. And when I came back after three days, I'll start on the upper right because that's the outside. Okay. And the, the material crept up about an inch on the outside. Now on the inside, the center photo, um, it actually crept up higher because when you have two panels together, it allows it make it uses capillary action and allows the material to actually get sucked up in between those panels and right. drawn up into them. So that's the creeping. So it actually crept up an inch and three quarters between the panels with a heavy coating. Now, if you look bottom right, the thing that surprised me was when I opened them up and looked. Now, all the way to the top of those five-inch plates, there was a thin film of oil all the way to the very top. So you get a heavy coating, an inch and three quarters a thin film all the way to the top of the plate. So it was pretty amazing. And th that's what we planned on when we designed this product. Denny, Dennis had a, a big hand in creating this product. And we wanted to make sure that two things. Number one, it was heavy enough to stick to vertical walls. Right. Yep. Like if you did unispotter work on a quarter or a door, yep. it's got to stick with enough film thickness uh, to, to get adequate corrosion protection. However, you can see in the red circle, it's got a little puddle of thinner material that flows out, and that's what is able to creep up into these cavities. So kind of that two-prong approach. You know, it's perfect. I just We have a couple more uh, questions that have popped up on the screen that are specific to cavity wax because we get questions on this product. You know, people say, if I just put one coat, is it going to be enough? How do I know that I've coated properly? This question is specifically, can I use too much cavity wax? Dennis? I, I don't think you can. I mean, our tests were with 30 mils or or 30 thousandths of an inch thick coatings. Um, we recommend three coats. 
And if you're inside a closed cavity, you want to make sure that you draw that wand in and out at least three times yep. to make sure that you've, and, and you can manipulate it around to make sure that you do coat the entire area. And, and then the other piece is, uh, you know, if it's dripping out of the drain holes, you know you got enough of it in there probably. But Which it's supposed to do. It's that supposed means you're to do. saturated right. and right. this is one of the things right. that the product is designed to flow and as you talked about, flow uphill. Right. How, another great question, how do I clean the wands? Right, well, it's, it's very simple. You can just simply invert the can. So turn it upside down. And spray yep. until it clears the, the nozzle. That's it. Very simple. If you need to, we have a high pressure gun cleaner now that fits right on to the, to the wand and you can spray that through and clear the wand that yeah. way if yeah. you really need some That's extra innovation. cleaning. Right. Yeah. yeah, same valve, so you can just snap hey, it I on wanted, the gun cleaner. I wanted to address one thing on these questions, though. Okay. Can you use too much cavity wax? The only possible way you're using too much is if you clog the drain yeah. holes. Okay. So, And Good you point. would really, the way, the way that works, you would have to do something crazy and just go nuts with it to really be able to do that. But that's the one thing you want to be careful of is don't clog those drain, drain holes and then you're okay. fine. Okay, very good. So moving forward, corrosion protection at a glance. Sean, this was something when we started um, kind of down this road, you know, this was something you're very near and dear to. And the reason why is because every time you present it, you get technicians that are taking pictures of the screen. That's how you know you actually got some good content. Right. Um, but I want you to walk us through. Now, everyone um, tonight that's in attendance should have a printed version. We printed these out. Um, so that you can take them back to the shop with you, and that's the intent, so it's, it's kind of a very nice reference. Go ahead, walk us through this. Sure, so we'll walk through this. So what you're looking at is, a, is what we call the typical joint where you've got uh, an inner and outer frame rail, that's the black, okay? So now, between all welded flanges, we need to have something in there, okay. unless it's Chrysler when you're MIG welding. They say no weld through primer. Honda says when you're MIG welding, no weld through primer. All other situations, you wanna have something in that joint. And it depends on the welding method we choose, right? So if we're MIG welding, we obviously can't MIG weld through adhesives or sealers. So our only option is weld through primer, okay? okay? Or yep. none, like Chrysler and Honda. Now, if we're resistant spot welding, we have some options. We could use an adhesive in the joint if the manufacturer recommends okay. it or if it had a previous adhesive. Um, we could use a one-part MSP or urethane seam sealer. And again, that's this, this product here. Um, really good product. A lot of technicians don't know that this can be applied directly to bare metal and it can be spot welded through. Right. Okay. I feel the need to ask you what the part number is. Yeah, well it's 8360, okay. but there's a whole series of these that are different colors and come in different cartridges or whatever. So okay. 8360, 8361, you just yep. keep going on yep. 8360 good. numbers, right? So really superior product that, that works well, that can be put in the joint, spot welded right through. You could use weld through coating, um, again, if it's recommended, or if there's OEM e-coat on the replacement part, you can leave that on and spot weld through that. So you have many more options of MIG welding. Now, what are the acceptable substrates that we can seam seal over? And that's really what spawned this because I get so many questions on that. So what can we apply it to? 2K epoxy sealer, uh, seams, epoxy primer, or yep. our 2K urethane primer. Those are your best bets. That could include primer fillers or even sealers. Okay. Okay. And scuffed. As long as they're 2K. Yep. Scuffed e coat. Okay. So Dennis, when you say, "Hey, these new panels you get in that aren't aren't yep. e uh, seam sealed," you can leave the e coat <coughs> on. Just scuff the e coat and seal right over the e coat. Exactly. You don't need to prime that area because it's got the e coat. Um, and then uh, OEM paint. If that situation arises, you can apply it over OEM paint. It's going to stick just fine as long as it's scuffed. Okay. Now. How about bare metal seam sealer? Yep. Well, we can apply that over everything we just mentioned in addition to clean, properly prepared bare metal. And then just one precaution with bare metal seam sealers, just make sure you get adequate coatings over the top. Okay. If you have spray from one direction and end up with a shadow side with thin coatings, you know, you, you're, you're, uh, you're prone to corrosion. Remember, there's no safety net with a bare metal seam sealer. There's no primer underneath right. it, okay? Right. now. What should we not seam seal over? And this is really the big bugaboo for me because the main thing I see guys doing is seam sealing over etch primer. Okay. So don't seam seal over etch primer. The chemistry does not mix well with the chemistries of seam sealers. So normally they require to you, you to prime over etch primer in order to paint. Well, it's no different with a seam sealer. And it's not just 3M saying that, it's many other companies, paint companies, et cetera. Um, or, or a 1K primer. Okay. 1K rattle can primers are, you know, they're convenient, but they're not good coatings. They peel off very easily, especially over time. I've seen many roof ditch areas fail 
where that's the weak link. You can wipe it right off with a solvent. Yeah, they just don't have the corrosion protection. Exactly. What exactly. about filler? What about body filler? Yeah, you, don't want, you want to avoid that as well. I understand sometimes you get close where there's filler towards the edge, maybe a little spot, but generally over primer. filler, no, you want to prime that first. Um, over weld through primer, obviously we never seam seal over that. Burn paint, soot, yep. rust, unsound surfaces, those stay away from those. So Great. that's pretty much it in a nutshell right there. And if you again, have that, walk away, it's a good walk away piece. In addition, on the opposite side of that, what we've done is kind of given you a corrosion protection, maybe starter kit, um, where it is kind of just highlighting focused products to make it help, to, to help you make it very, very simple and easy. Your um, uh, sheet will have much more detailed information like part numbers for you, just kind of the go-to, say top 10. Um, just as a good reference point for you. And speaking of reference, you know, for all of our distributor partners, thank you very much um, for helping us host and put this on. A good reference for yourselves as well as our, our end user shops. And any others, we've got three seam sealer products that cover 95% of the seams out there, both in a one part and a two part. Of course, we've got a variety of colors, but um, these are very, very uh, kind of straightforward and many of you probably know the part numbers as is, but these three products, um, do gonna, most of your work. Right. One right. from each category and you're going to pretty much be able to do everything and that eliminates a lot of half empty cartridges, waste, expired products, everything else when you can consolidate it down to basically three products. Yeah, right on. And so we've talked a lot about OEM process, we've talked about procedure, we've talked about um, QC, we've, we've talked about product. Um, and, and, and specifically around the products is, of course, uh, making sure that you're getting reimbursed for all the body materials that you need to use to make the proper repair according to the OEM. And so what we've done is created a new program. It's called Collision Repair Materials Planner, CRIMP, as you may know the acronym, and we love acronyms at 3M. <laughs> um, but it's a, something you may have heard of, and if you haven't, we have specialists that are on site for you this evening um, to talk to you about if this is a good fit for your shop. But the whole premise is, is to make, give you a tool that makes it easy for you to not only identify and plan for the materials, document the procedures as the OEM states and the materials that they want you to use, and then give you a worksheet as well as generate an invoice that encompasses all of the products that we should be using on a repair, including cavity wax, which we know is one that oftentimes gets overlooked. And so it's a, another reminder for you to be able to not only doc, plan and document the repair, but also be able to provide documentation that helps you get them reimbursed from your insurance partner. Yep. All right. And so uh, ultimately, we, we put together a uh, what is crimp worksheet for you. Again, that's another takeaway for you. Uh, we do encourage you to have a conversation uh, about how crimp can work for you so that when you're making all of these repairs, that you're getting reimbursed for all the materials. And again, the quantities. Um, that you're using and, and you're expected to use to make a quality repair. So please do uh, take a moment and uh, take a minute and, and reach out to a specialist this evening if you haven't already. This is a great tool and again, uh, not a one size fits all, but uh, understand if we can have a conversation, we, we can understand a little bit better how it might work out for you. Um, fresh reminder about again, the industry information, SOPs and, and, and OEM recommendations. Of course, uh, on the 3M Collision website, we have a, a variety, a host of resources. Of course, when you come to our homepage, uh, there'll be a link at the top that says resources and that's where you can get into the OEM procedures. Um, and then SOPs, we've got upwards of, I think 97 was the most recent number that I had, 97 standard operating procedures. And it's not just about corrosion protection, it's about start to finish. It's about helping you understand how to have a process in place for buffing and compounding, right? So step by step by step, you're saving time and money and you're getting more consistent finishes on the back end and you're helping build through process, um, a, 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 a process that takes the guesswork out and gives you more consistent, reliable results. Including aluminum SOPs and as well. Including aluminum, and you know a little bit about aluminum with these industry nights. This is where we, uh, we started, started the concept, right? That's right. And so, you know, as we're talking about just segueing as we finish up here, you know, QC is something I know that's very, very near and dear to your heart. Um, walk us through the importance of a process, QC process. Sure. The well, the, the big thing to think about here is if you are writing an estimate, your estimators are doing a good job and they're applying the cavity wax or, or they're writing it for cavity wax. If the technicians are not following through on the backside and applying it, now you've billed for something that was not performed. Right. And that's big trouble with the insurance company, right? So be very careful about that. So somebody should be looking at these repairs and identifying what was done and that everything was done correctly. So I just have some ideas uh, to, to make you think about. So, you know, a lot of the shops, when I ask, they have a QC pr uh, process in place. 
Um, very few of them actually do. Most of it involves just a pencil whip list at the end of the repair. When everything's covered, everything's buried, you can't see what was actually done on the car. So I had some things where I uh, put together this where, you know, one of the ideas is, is just random inspections. Sure. And I work in a shop next to a guy that did a lot of things that really weren't kosher, I would have never done. And I thought to myself, you know, if I was the boss, I would take one of those cars or anybody's cars in the shop once a month, put them on a two-post lift, and give them just a fine-tooth comb inspection. Just for your own satisfaction that you're doing everything correctly, right? Yeah. The other th benefit there is if guys know somebody's looking, they're more inclined to be a little more conscientious and remember to get everything yep. in there, okay? Yep. Yep. So that's a very simple uh, process that you can do. Another one is either hiring a third party to come in, like Verifax, okay. and do those inspections. Yep. And you get a complete report, it's very good. You can tell your customers you're third party verified, whatever. That works very well. Or you turn one of your own people in-house into a, their, the inspector, like your production manager that was maybe a former body tech. So, you know, you can find somebody technically inclined in the shop, they could do these inspections in the process as well. Um, another thing that works well, especially for shops that are working on a team concept, where they work together as a team in, in, in groups, is peer inspection. So this works where if I get done welding a panel on, um, I, I ask my buddy, hey, you know, Tom, come over here, look at this. He looks at all the welds, checks them out, and maybe makes some suggestions, I missed a spot or whatever, but just a fresh set of eyes looking at that is always a good idea, so you could have peer inspection. Sure. And you can make up forms, you know, as a vehicle travels through the processes, somebody checked off what was done. Another one, file handlers or estimators could do QC work, especially if the, somebody's technical, maybe again, a former body tech. Um, you know, uh, do they always have time for that? Maybe not, so that might not work for all shops. And then lastly, really, an experienced or a well-trained detailer. I worked with a detailer that was in the industry many years, and this guy caught every little detail you could imagine. He was very, very good and That's thorough. why they call him a detailer. There you go. <laughs> he caught all the details. So, so um, maybe he doesn't do all the inspection, but maybe even just the cavity wax and corrosion protection at the end of the repair. Right, right, so right. it's not one size fits all. It's right. different for every shop, but you really should have some kind of in-process quality control going on in your shop. Right on, and equally important, it's not just 3M talking about and being passionate about standard operating procedures, of course, Verifax is, is recommending and telling us we, right? right. Yep, this is, I put this here because I just wanna show, this isn't just 3M, here's Verifax, and these are standard operations, you know, industry standards, and where they talk about not using uh, etch primer to yep. seam seal over, making sure your primer and your seam seal are compatible, um, sealing the edges of the seams, um, match, you know, uh, uh, duplicate match the, the factory appearance. look, which is something we have a host of videos to help you do because it seems like an impossible task. Right. Let us help you. Duplicate factory appearance, seal whether it was seal, seam sealed or not, and then lastly, applying cavity, cavity wax to all those panels. Yes, absolutely. So a couple of quality control tools that you found uh, in shops and also inspectors carrying, right. but also great tools to have in the right. shop. Well, like I say, you know, if the inspectors have these certain tools, you should have the same ones, yeah. okay? So very simple things like mirrors and, and lighted mirrors and, you know, I, it was very common for me to go in a lit mirror and go on the bottom of a rocker that was freshly welded on, um, painted, everything done, ready to go down the road, and the back side of that rocker panel had all kinds of untreated welds. It was very common. So things of that nature, a sun gun to help identify some paint Swirls. defects. Yeah, uh, two post lift is very valuable for your inspections and also, by the way, I used to drive my car over and apply the cavity wax and undercoatings on that two post lift where you had better access. And then finally, a mill thickness gauge where you can double check those coatings, make sure you're getting enough coatings on all the areas. You might even identify that, hey, maybe we're using way more clear that we need, than we need to and sure. we're wasting materials. But it's very interesting to go around with a mill thickness gauge and check to see you know, if you're getting into bad habits, leaving areas that are thinner or whatever. So yeah. having the right tools is very important. And another industry partner as we finish up here, of course, the 3M iCar Alliance. Uh, very Thank you very much for sponsoring, helping us bring this content and allowing technicians to get credit towards their iCar certification and, and classifications. Um, variety of courses that are offered online now. Right, and we're offering more and more online courses through the iCar Alliance. You can see there's, there's panel repair on there, there's corrosion protection, there's a few of these classes and we're adding more all the time. We're working on those as we speak. So you'll be able to take uh, not just iCar classes which are kind of general, you can take them right from us that we can talk more specifically about our products and get more 
tight information on our products. So really good, uh, they don't have to leave their shop and they right. can get their ICAR slash 3M training. How to, how to use, where to use, why to use, when to use, all those good insightful tips coming from folks that came right out of the shop. So in summary, we do apologize. We took a little bit more of your time than we would have liked, but uh, we felt that uh, the content and the material is important for us to, to have conversation and make sure that we tease out all the insights and, and the perspectives these two have here. You know, in, in summary, of course, always follow the OEM guidelines. Use resources such as 3M Collision, uh, Collision Hub, Collision Repair University, ICAR, right? Uh, be current, try to stay current, never make an assumption about if something's changed or not changed and refer to those OEM guidelines to make sure that we're making the repair the way the OEM is telling us to make it. Putting a QC process or a check that fits your shop into place and having standard operating procedures so you have consistency. Take the guesswork out and a consistent repair process to better ensure that you're protecting your, yourself, protecting your shop, and most importantly, protecting the customer. All right. So, live Q&A. We did take a handful of questions here over the course of uh, the 75 minutes. and. Um, and so ultimately, we, we want to be able to answer some of your questions. Of course, with time, we have to get you to a post-test as well. Um, however, uh, we want to do take a couple of questions that have come in uh, this evening. I'll start with, um, I think the first one that I like is, you state we can't seam seal over self-etching primer. Why is that? I think Sean kind of alluded to that earlier, but I, I, in general, it's because the chemistries do not, are not compatible. And the self-etch primer, and when we talk about self-etch primer, a true self-etch primer is going to be a two-component material that it has an acid in it. Sure. Okay, so oftentimes the word self-etch is loosely used in the business. Okay. And it could be misconceived as a aerosol self-etch primer or etching primer. Yep. And indeed, the aerosols do not provide adequate corrosion protection, and that would be one good reason why we would say don't do that. And the other one is that if it has acid in it, it doesn't play well with the with the chemistries in the seam sealers. Okay. All right. Can we apply a 2K primer with a dauber? I'll, I'll take that one. So one of the recommendations we make is, um, let's say you put a rear body panel on a vehicle, okay, and you do all your welding on the outside, and you clean off all your welds, you have bare metal all the way around there. You don't want to wait for the painter to, to, to jam it or paint it. Um, can you just mix up some 2K in a, in a PPS cup? and take a dauber, like a windshield dauber, and go around and, and apply primer and seam seal over that, absolutely, there's no reason that you can't do that. It's actually a great way to do that. I, you know, your other alternative is a bare metal seam sealer. Well, if it's me, I always like to have a, a, a primer underneath there, so I'm gonna use a dauber, especially in areas like inside, you know, trunk areas and areas that really aren't visible. Um, you know, there's really no reason you can't do that. Okay, all right. Is it okay to weld through bare metal seam sealer? It's okay to weld through bare metal seam sealer that has enough open time to work with. Okay. So when I say that, if we're referring to a two-part bare metal seam sealer, it's not gonna work out. Okay. If, you're, we're, if we're referring to a one-part bare metal seam sealer, uh, like the uh, sausage pack of seam sealer that's here, or an MSP sealer in the same kind of package, or the urethane seam sealer in a hard cartridge, yes, that's fine to spot weld through that material. Okay, all right. Can I use panel bond as a seam sealer? Okay, I'll take that. Um, well, if you, if, if you seal the seam and you have adequate squeeze out everywhere with no voids, and you just clean that off with a glove finger or rag, whatever, and, there se and, there, and the seam is completely sealed and you leave it that way, that's just fine. I wouldn't take um, panel bonding and actually apply it and seal the seam that way. As it's a really, bead. Right, as a bead. It's really not right. flexible. Like we mentioned, you really should use a flexible seam sealer, but um, you could you know, use a flexible seam sealer over the top of panel bonding as well. But to use it as, apply it and use it as a seam sealer, I would not do that. We have other great products Let's just that, use a that seam are designed. Sealer exactly. As a seam sealer. Exactly. Can I use bare, bare metal seam sealer as a primer than a, than a cosmic seam. Can I use bare metal seam sealer as a primer than a cosmic so, cosmetic so, seam? So sometimes we get a question like, if I wanted to make a seam or apply, apply a specific seam sealer that would, have, that would form a shaped seam bead that matched the OEM, could I make that and then attach it to the car after I put some bare metal seam sealer on as a primer? Okay. I've heard that question before. And 
in reality, I would probably discourage people from doing that. And it's simply because seam sealers and anything that's, that's in a very thin film can oftentimes be um, unable to protect from corrosion properly. So even paint companies, when you look at their technical sheets, will always have a minimum mill thickness that they want primers to be applied at or clear to be applied at because they know they've done their homework on the testing. You have to have enough material on there if you're expecting it to perform right. in environmental conditions that a car is subjected to. Right. Okay, so I would not recommend it for that. I would say the best thing to do would be use primer, two-part primer. Use a dauber, as Sean suggested, but primer, you could see the OEM method. There was no bare metal seam sealer anywhere on the body of that vehicle after it came out of that e-coat bath. And just to elaborate on that, we kind of, we didn't give it a lot of time, but talking about the bare metal seam sealer, we did mention that, you know, make sure you have adequate coatings over the top of it. Because what can happen is when a seam sealer has a taller profile, and if you only spray from one direction, yes. sometimes you get that little cliff edge over on the shadow side um, of that seam sealer. If you can't spray from the opposite direction to fill in that shadow side, you're, you're yep. playing with fire, yep. okay? so really adequate coatings are really important because again, there's, there's no safety net with bare metal seam sealers. All right. All right. Uh, on behalf of myself, my esteemed colleagues with uh, decades of industry experience, that's just reality, gentlemen. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for having us. Uh, thank you for so much for uh, allowing us the time to be able to, to bring uh, knowledge and perspective and we sure hope that you've gotten value. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for watching.